So we are now inaugurating the webinars in 2023 with a speaker who is speaking about uh, was speaking about performance activity last year. She did very well. People really liked it. Magali Fonny Plouf. Uh, I want to introduce her. Uh, so Magali Fonny Plouf is a pedagogical counselor at André Grasset College. She teaches history at Cégep Marie Victorin. She uh, also had a great academic experience in teaching in many uh, places. Cégep Cégep Saint Jérôme Collège André Grasset and College Jean de Brébeuf. She's very interested in pedagogy, and she did a master's degree in education at the University of Montréal, obtained a, a winter 2020 that uh, adds to her master's degree in history. She did some research in her master's in education, brought her to write two articles, Pedagogy Collegial, uh, 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 Anxiety Performance, Anxiety in College, and Anxiety with the Teachers. The second article is a re critical reflection on the usage of the competition competitiveness as a pedagogical tool. I wish you a great webinar, mesdames et messieurs. Welcome to our colleague, Magali. Thank you, Nicole. I'm gonna share my presentation. I put a lot of color into it so that it works uh, with the theme, uh, learning through games. So, um, Thank you for inviting me once again after the first uh, webinar on performance anxiety. Here I am again for another uh, presentation. This is very different than last time for those who were there. As was mentioned, I'm a pedagogical counselor. Uh, it's my principal role, uh, educational counselor, but uh, I'm talking here about my experience. Uh, we are, uh, at my work at Cégep Marie-Victorien was, was a TA and it's not theoretical. Uh, where I'm not presenting a literature review or theoretical concepts, really sharing my experience. So there's something here that was initiated for me the uh, fall of 2021, and, and I continue on with that. I will talk about that. So it's really sharing in my practice is people who are more qualified uh, than me on uh, games-based learning, but I'm gonna present six activities, six examples of uh, game-based activities or that are based in uh, um, related to certain skills and time and the classroom and made for the classroom. And I also think that they are easy to adapt to, to different disciplines. So these are formats or um, types of activities and uh, more than uh, one specific game with one uh, related to one specific discipline. So I'm gonna first give you a context of where the experience that I had came from, six activities, uh, examples of activities, play activities. And I'm gonna talk about the perception of the students that I. Uh, uh, re, uh, that I gathered. I did, didn't do detailed research, but I found it interesting to uh, talk to the students. Um, so before starting all of this, I wanted to know who I was talking to. There's a lot of people who are here today. So I had some questions. Uh, Nicole. Uh, so survey questions. We'll start with the first one. So I'm um, asking you what frequency you integrate games into class. Uh, so this is about revision of content, but it could also be for new learning and for evaluation. Uh, is it never, sometimes, from time to time, regularly, in all, almost all classes, or it doesn't apply to my situation? I'm not a teacher. So I will let you uh, vote. There's already 45 people out of 49, 95% of people have already participated in the survey. We will uh, leave 10 more seconds. So I think we can uh, stop uh, the survey now. Um, so it's very varied. And uh, there's a few people, a good percentage of people that knew it never or rarely. Some people from time to time or regularly, that's the majority. And some 7% that do it in almost all classes. So I hope you will gain some new ideas from my presentation today. So we can go to the next question. Second question.
uh, won't be too long. I still looking at the frequency uh, question. How, how am I going to find the other question? I'll let you continue. Hold on a minute. And we, just a moment. I think I found it. Okay. So now for those who experimented, tried games in class, I have them in certain categories. Uh, um, so there's a list here of types of games that you can use in class. Uh, it's not uh, a full list. There's a other category. I want you to check uh, all the boxes that apply, uh, if uh, that applies to you. Uh, so there you go. I'll let you uh, answer. It may take a bit more time. There's already 75% of the participants who participated uh, in the survey. Um, Megali, tell me when you want me to stop. So far, there's 80% of people who have answered. We can show the results, I think. Yes, uh, with pleasure. So uh, I was expecting that interacting, uh, interactive quizzes, code uh, with clap, et cetera, 86%. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. People already know about that. It's uh, kind of limited in a way. I'm going to talk about more traditional quiz uh, type games like uh, uh, Trivial Pursuit and Bingo, uh, um, crossword puzzles, uh, simulations or role-playing games. I'm not going to talk about that today. There are so many great simulations and role-playing games that have been presented already. So there, all the strategies uh, have been used, as we can see here, some more than others. So I'm happy to see there's 9% for bingo. That's something I will present today that may inspire you. So we can go to the last question now. One moment. So I'm interested in knowing what the obstacles are uh, to integrate games into your teaching. So select those who apply to you. Is it the lack of imagination or ideas that makes it so you don't uh, do that? Is it because there's not enough time for preparing these games? Is it difficulty in taking time in class for uh, uh, game-based activities? Are you skeptical as to the efficacy uh, pedagogy of certain games? Uh, do you worry that these games are not necessarily interesting for the students or is it uh, a lack of uh, competency with the digital tools that stops you from using that in your teaching? Because uh, most people have integrated these tools, uh, these games into their teaching already. Up to now, um, 40 people have answered out of 57 of the 80 percent of people have answered very interesting interesting because this is data that we can keep yes happy to be able to adapt my presentation uh, to those uh, who are listening i don't know how many answers we have but um So there's 78% uh, people answered the survey. Um, can I close the survey, Megali? Yes, uh, we uh, need time for the rest of the presentation. Okay, I'm sharing the results now. So uh, mostly it's a question of time to prepare and uh, 
put together these games. These activities we're going to present today are things that are pretty easy and uh, quick to prepare that are just reusing revision questions that you would already do in class, but to use them in another format and have more engagement with the students. It doesn't necessarily require uh, more work, maybe a little bit more, depending on the parameters you will select. Lack of imagination, uh, a bit more than 50%, uh, so that maybe that uh, can be helped today. We can inspire you, possibly. I, there's not a lot of people that are skeptical of the efficacy of games. I'm not going to. I'm going to talk about that, but the most important thing for me is to start from a pedagogical lead, a need. Uh, so to start from pedagogy to determine games and not the other way around. So I'm going to uh, begin my presentation. I wanted to give you some context, first of all, of uh, this crazy idea that I had in the fall 2021. This is the context uh, that I was confronted with. Um, first, I was teaching uh, an adult education class at Sajid Parimtari, a history class, and I had a schedule that uh, didn't really like it. Friday night from 6.30 to 9.30. So already I was fearful uh, of a high rate of absenteeism. It's a, a mandatory course. So for, uh, uh, so for those who remember, it was a Western history class, uh, Western Civ, but now uh, world history. And it is a part of the uh, social science program. And I hear students sometimes are apprehensive with the, the content. It's not something they've chosen and uh, it's uh, mandatory. They don't like history and I'm trying to change their perspective sometimes. So uh, more context, it's an adult education class. I said that and it, it's a lot of issues for me in terms of uh, student engagement in terms of the absenteeism as well. So we have a student population very heterogeneous. That we have students who are going back to school, who have families that don't have a lot of time for studying and that have a higher absentee rate for their example, if their children are sick, but usually those children are, those people are very engaged and it's a generalization course. But there's also students that were kicked out of the regular uh, program and they have more difficulties in having engagements. Some, some students who work and study full time, so their studies are a bit, it's not the center of their life. So already there are issues uh, the abandonment rate, uh, the dropout rate, the participation rate, engagement is difficult. Also, so it was also at the fall session 2021, a return from the uh, to the pandemic. We, we're still masking and that added to more difficulties and that was uh, documented the effect uh, on the engagement and the motivation, the pandemic and the masking. So we had a year and a half of pandemic uh, and we saw the effects. So this whole uh, mix of things made me worried about potential engagement and participation of my students. So as I don't like to do things halfway, my solution will be to start each of my classes uh, with a short activity, a game-based activity to uh, revise the uh, content of the previous class or a few classes uh, uh, together. So usually I revise, uh, sometimes with code, and uh, there are weeks where it was just a quiz, uh, the game activity we did, but sometimes there are questions that I was asking for the group and some people would answer, but those who are generally disengaged would not participate. So I figured I would do it differently. Why did I choose game-based activities for uh, content? Well, I thought it would get the students participating on a Friday night, get them a bit active. Um, and um, I thought it was simpler, easier to, uh, less risky really, to use uh, gaming to revise content as uh, rather than for new content, we have to really think about the parameters in the game. And, and so it was uh, a better avenue with revision than new content. So this, uh, I did 12 uh, game-based uh, activities, gaming activities, uh, uh, except for the first uh, class and the ones where we had exams. And I continued to use these activities, uh, maybe less systematically after that. But this is not a presentation of all the activities. Some of them were last session. Some of them were in the fall uh, of last year. So the benefits that I saw in the beginning, reactivate and review the learning of the students in a more effective way than asking questions of the class. Um, 
activate the interest of the students from the beginning of the class and motivate them, maybe increase the engagement long term in class. And finally, it was much more than that. And we were uh, looking at perception. I don't have any concrete data to present uh, some at the end, but this is what I perceived uh, in my experience on the ground. So it made the class more dynamic, the surprise effect also to not know what the game would be really to make the class more dynamic and fun and uh, increased presence in class and retention of students I had a lower rate of absenteeism for my class and a better retention rate. It increased the sense of competency and confidence of my students, of my students to uh, help them to go quickly and be more confident and uh, carry on uh, with their learning uh, more quickly. So it was a lot of uh, fun and consolidate the relationship with the students and also the relationship with the students themselves between them because there's a lot of activities that are as a team and develop collaboration and communication skills between them as well because they have teamwork to do. These are elements that they develop with these game-based activities. So before getting into the strategies, I'm just gonna do a bit of auto promotion here a bit of shameless plugging. This is the article I wrote on competition as a pedagogical strategy. Does the best uh, person win? So the QR code is there. You can find it uh, through Google, but uh, if you wanna go read that, I won't uh, present my paper here. Just a few elements uh, rather. This, this article I was asking if uh, competition really favorizes the learning for students and under what conditions. So I'm, um, showing you some of the conclusions it's not the whole thing but the competition is uh, effective when we uh, favorize equality of chances equality of opportunity to succeed so it allows everybody to uh, have a chance to win so it doesn't uh, uh, disadvantage some people avoid uh, constraining competition with too many rules i try to keep it as simple as possible give uh, feedback that is uh, efficient and uh, rich uh, in content so I tried as much as possible. The students will be able to get some feedback, not always personalized, but at least a very uh, uh, detailed and global uh, uh, feedback and to not give too much importance to the notion of performance. So we'll look at more the importance of learning and improving uh, the uh, learning situation. That's how I communicate the activities. Um, in another way, like for example, there's no uh, prize for the person who wins. It's not uh, what is expected. Uh, so often there's an element that the students don't control in the activity that can uh, explain who wins uh, and who loses or who doesn't win rather. So uh, it takes away the performance aspect of it and favorize competition against ourselves. So, improve, uh, so favorize improvement and uh, intergroup uh, uh, instead of competition between students. So that's what I do with Kahoot. When we look at the conditions, uh, it's really interesting. The students like Kahoot, it's simple as well but it also uh, puts a lot of accent on performance and the podiums and at the end of each question at the end of the, the whole thing when the student that gets three out of 15 and see the winner gets 14 out of 15 it can uh, uh, have an effect on their self-esteem on their confidence so we um, are really uh, in a competition kind of space here interpersonal competition there's, there's a lot of uh, not a lot of those are complex questions so i try to some activities that, that I proposed today, I don't want to have complex questions in them. I didn't respect all the conditions every time, but uh, that was what I had in mind. So um, a few examples. I want to present, uh, first of all, the lexicon, uh, some activities, uh, examples. And so the first thing is the level of digital skill for the teacher. So if uh, it's a green circle, it's low, it means that it's accessible to everybody, low barrier to entry. You don't need to learn uh, new tools and new skills. It's so uh, user friendly. When it's medium, you need to learn to use a simple tool. It still remains accessible to everybody. There's one where there's an alternative, a red alternative. I will talk about that, a red dot, but that's not what I used and experimented myself. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the length uh, for the activity in class uh, in minutes, but it's uh, very variable depending on the parameters you will choose. I put how many, how much time I put into these activities because most of them I tested them more than once. And uh, the complexity of cognitive tasks uh, required. So uh, that's always uh, near the surface. Um, so simple means declarative con uh, knowledge like definitions, uh, 
association uh, questions uh, into uh, comprehension and when it's orange we're more into medium complexity uh, questions of comprehension more complex sometimes uh, uh, applying certain theories or knowledge and analysis and so just to situate you but it's a very imperfect scale so let's start the first one i talked about in the beginning is the revision bingo it's one of the first uh, experiences that i had before uh called 2021 so this is what i use but there are plenty of applications that generate bingo cards starting with a list of words so it could be words it could be symbols i even tested with uh, mathematical variables it's possible as well or, ma or mathematical equations or names and so you can see an example here on the right that i used in a uh, uh, western uh, civ a western history class so there's a bingo card each student if there's more than 30 you have to print the, the uh, same card more than once but if there are 30 or less everybody has a different card so how it works is i ask a question and the answer to that question will be on the card and so they have to first of all find the answer and then see if it's on their bingo card so it's very simple it's not uh, complex at all you just prepare some questions with answers for uh, activity for revision and it, uh, the app transforms it into a bingo game so yes there's a bit of competition a bit of an interpersonal competition here but there's a uh, chance factor as well the students know that the person who will have the bingo first is more a question of chance than anything else you can parameter certain elements you can change certain things as a visual aspect with the tab as well i use the classic uh, layout but there's lots of other visual representations also you can choose the number of uh, boxes five by five is the one i chose but you can do four by four or three by three you can also determine uh, that the middle one is a free space. It's a, uh, I didn't give them any free answers that uh, you can see here. And you can also start a list of more than 20. If you take uh, uh, 25 uh, five by five, you can have a list of 40 uh, questions and they will pick them randomly uh, from the app and some words will not be on the uh, cards. And so I say 25 questions, everybody has 100% of the words. Uh, and I do a lot of challenges. So I start with a complete line, a, full, a vertical line, sometimes an X or the four corners, or at the end, I get to filling the whole bingo card. So if the students have found the answers to all the questions, their whole card is filled. Um, so at the end, uh, the feedback that I give is I ask the students uh, when uh, people uh, that have not uh, filled out all the boxes, we try to answer the questions uh, together. So it's... Um, a group uh, feedback and it uh, allows the students who missed the question to get the uh, right answer and to identify that question so that was the first activity very simple the second one is in the same uh, style and uh, there's some things on the screen here i don't see so uh, uh, digital skill uh, very simple the app doesn't uh, ask you to um, even create an account it's very easy and it takes 15 to 20 minutes again if you uh, make it smaller, a four by four or three by three. Of course, three by three is uh, not as uh, uh, extensive for bingo, but it depends on the formula you want to use. So um, for the questions, these are uh, simple questions. You can get into comprehension, basic comprehension, but uh, not much more than that. However, um, for a, a math class, we can uh, do exercises to find the answers and uh, so you can adapt it to different uh, kinds of subjects. So uh, crosswords, there's an app here on the screen. These are two different apps. There's lots of them who do this. Uh, for the same as Bingo, you connect, you don't have to create an account and you can produce uh, a crossword puzzle from a series of words and definitions. And so it could be question answers. Uh, you can see how you want to do it, um, decide how you want to do it. I allow the students in this context to do it uh, as a team or alone, but I also, I always value teamwork and uh, it can be used for a diagnostic evaluation as well for a tech. And so the uh, crossword puzzle you see on the top was the uh, Quebec history plot. For a lot of students that I had who didn't do uh, high school in the Quebec system. So I wanted to know their level of knowledge of Quebec history. So I put questions there on certain elements we covered during the semester, and it allows me to identify things that are uh, we need to work on. And at the end of the uh, semester, I did the same crossword 
puzzle. I had timed them the first time at the beginning of the trimester. I did the same thing at the end, which allowed them to see that they uh, improved and that uh, the crossword puzzle was now easy for them. So this is another way of using it. Uh, but, uh, really, you can use it to uh, revise concepts and to test the content for your class. And so uh, a lot of people do this with crossword puzzles. I saw some of you uh, had already done that. I won't spend too much time on that. But I have a college uh, colleague who has done this with mathematics. So it is adaptable to many disciplines. So there you go. Those are the two first activities that I want to present. So if there are things that you are influenced by that you want to share in the chat, some examples um, of things that you do in your own classes, don't hesitate. Once again, very simple in terms of digital competency, digital skills. Depends on the complexity of the questions, how much time it'll take. If it's very simple, it can take five, 10 minutes. In my case, it took 10, 15 minutes in the beginning of the class. So we are going towards more complex elements as we go forward. The third one is uh, the post-it game. Uh, so guess who's on my forehead? So Canva is the app that proposes models to, pr to uh, print cards. I didn't create them. I just added the images and I uh, put the years and the uh, names of the people there. And I did that uh, in the evening before class. And uh, I wrote some names on post-its and I asked people to put them on their forehead. So teams of four or five and the objective, uh, you all know this game is to guess what person they have on their forehead and asking yes or no questions only. I suggest some aspects they can ask questions on. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, country of origin of the person, the historical period they were involved in, um, uh, related to historical activity, for example, the French Revolution. So I tried to encourage them to ask questions related to the elements we covered in class and not uh, questions that are too simple to... Uh, I always remind the students that the game is for revision. So that's important and that's why they could use their notes. It's a great way uh, to help them to organize their notes and to remember certain things through their notes. And um, so, the other part of it, uh, the other side of the card, there are always highlights and information about uh, the person. So when they guess uh, the person, I ask them to read the information to remind everybody else. So somebody asked the question, is it possible to do this activity uh, remotely? I think no, because the person from their screen would see the image they project. So are there adaptations? Yes, it's an excellent question. I hadn't thought of that, but I am sure we can adapt it to, to communicate uh, individually to the other students the name of the uh, first historical personality, but it can be more complex. Uh, um, maybe we can adapt it to, to do it. So um, the one that I haven't tried yet, but I'm looking at is the who am I? I remember we had that game uh, we uh, would ask questions does he have a mustache if he has a no mustache we eliminate all those who have a mustache and you understand it's by elimination so i thought it would be very interesting to do that same way but again to suggest types of questions that are more relevant but this uh, requires more uh, cards more material because each student will need a series of cards so uh, there you go um of course um, it's relevant in the class where we learned about many historical figures. If there's five only, it'll be too easy. We need a certain level of complexity. So I think of other classes than uh, like uh, psychology, with different uh, psychological currents, uh, um, literature, philosophy, for example, other classes. We can adapt this exercise to instead of uh, a historical figure, some concepts like certain specific concepts that you want to review with your students. There's a way to adapt it for other contexts where it's not necessarily a historical figure uh, to, uh, um, yes, well, that answers the question Michel Basset was asking in uh, the uh, QA. Can we do it with de word definitions? Yes, 
it could be who am I or what word are we looking for. So in classes where we uh, teach vocabulary in different languages, for example, in Spanish or uh, in German, the student must uh, pick, uh, must uh, guess the word, use their vocabulary. So there's a lot of ways to adapt it. That's what I want to do today was to present uh, some examples, uh, the ones I use, but there are lots of different ways of doing things. So as what I do is generally uh, one uh, person, one to circle finger per student, but some extra ones. If there's a team that has finished quickly, I give more historical figures. I have more cards so that everybody can continue to play uh, and uh, uh, cover the full time of the activity. So uh, I give it 15, 20 minutes and in terms of complexity to uh, variations use Canva. Of course, you have to uh, get Canva and learn how to use it. If you do it with post-its, it can be uh, done very quickly when you have some time at the end of class. It's pretty simple to do. And for the questions, well, it depends. You can cover more complex questions of comprehension, causal uh, questions, cause-effect questions, but usually it's uh, more simple. So again, a game with some cards. This time, I... Uh, uh, I'm inspired by the timeline, Ling Jita, which is a card game. Um, I use the same model, uh, same model as Canva. Instead of uh, people, these are historical events this time. So on one side of the card, we have the name of the historical event. And on the other side, we have the years and the description. So it's to favorize the revision. And how it works? Uh, well, the idea is the students have to put the cards in the right chronological order. So this is not uh, about learning things by heart, but to learn the cause, of, cause and effect and what happened first that produced uh, these effects that brought something else to happen. So we talk about this when orally when they place their cards. We uh, think it through. So um, it's something that can be done um, in a less complex way in using uh, pieces of cardboard. You can... Uh, do a word table, you can do it on the chalkboard, the name of the event, and uh, so, uh, and you can make your own cards and do it uh, in an easier way with less content, but also complexity comes with uh, printing on both sides so that uh, the advantage of Canva is that it's already pre-programmed, it's easy to uh, fill out and print. So uh, always uh, four or five uh, students per team, so the idea is to be chronological. So at the beginning, in the uh, middle of the table, there's a card that I uh, put there. It's a different colored card that is right in the middle of the chronology. So I determine that, and it that one will be on the table. And then each student has four cards, um, and he doesn't know which ones he's going to get. He uh, only sees one at a time. He can draw one at a time only, and the other ones are unknown. So I ask uh, the oldest person to start. The person will place the card. We'll have to uh, see if the card in the center, uh, uh, if his card goes before or after. If the Treaty of Paris is before the uh, um, Guernica in Spain, the War of Secession in Spain, if, it, uh, if they're wrong, they have to put the card back and pick a new one. But if they put the card in the right place, they go to the next player. So they have three cards left. And the objective is the first student that gets rid of all their cards uh, um, and uh, is correct four times, uh, really. So to, uh, I ask them to turn the card over and they see the dates and I ask them to read uh, the content on the card. So of course this uh, is uh, less adaptable a little bit. So in different classes, in history, it's a great uh, exercise, but you could do it also uh, in any class where there's an evolution or a history, but in a, class where you have to teach a methodology or a process with different steps, for example, or they have to know in what order to do the steps uh, or how to apply a process. It's not as easy to adapt, but uh, you can uh, do it. Uh, another thing I want to add uh, is well, there's an interpersonal competition between the first person who wins in the team, uh, but also it, it becomes an intergroup competition because I'm asking the students to finish the sequence and to place all their cards in the right order and respecting uh, the turn order, the uh, order of play. So it becomes an intergroup competition because the first team that is able to finish uh, 
their sequence and they need the collaboration to uh, get there. So um, this is an activity that I think in the one that I'm presenting that has been very appreciated by the uh, students and it surprised me. So for complexity, digital complexity, uh, Canva is the same thing as the one before. It takes a bit more time, but uh, depends on the number of cards also. For me, it's four cards per student, but it could be three. You can do smaller teams as well. So there could be, uh, for me in history, there's a lot of cards that I can create, but in other disciplines, it's not as big. So you can do this in about 10 minutes. Uh, and 20 minute activity with very simple questions, uh, but the causal relationships were something in more complex a little bit in terms of comprehension. So I uh, should have maybe put an orange circle uh, there as well. The next two activities I'm gonna present are activities that I do before an evaluation. So before an exam or a final um, exam, so it's a revision activity and more of a macro of uh, revision in class. So I was already doing revision before the exam and now we do it in this uh, way. Uh, so it's a great success with students and I've been doing it for many years and I'm surprised that it's not uh, more well known or more widely used. So it's a uh, play facto, it's uh, uh, like a Jeopardy game, but uh, don't ask the, I don't give the answer ask for the question. There's a a lot amounts of money in the category and the, it's a three to five uh, uh, player team. So two players or less is not as good, three players at least. And I determine the teams for this game to be able to equal, to make the team pretty equal. I don't want to spend 40, 45 minutes on this activity. And there are students who have no chance of winning. So uh, knowing the students, I try to balance the teams. I don't tell them that, but I uh, want them to be uh, with other people than their friends. So that's uh, something that I uh, uh, focus on is teamwork. And uh, so uh, the idea is to win as much money as possible and answering as many questions on the board as possible. There are different types of questions. So $100 questions are very easy ones for true or false, uh, multiple choice. $500, question, $500 questions are questions that are multifaceted answers and more complex the answers and that you can't do with code. So I really like this for a revision activity. It's uh, very um, um, appropriate for that. And then you can decide the number of money, the number of categories to change the length of the activity. So if you can see on the top there, it's the table that I used for uh, Quebec uh, et le monde, uh, Quebec history class. And there's five categories and five uh, uh, questions for categories. So on the bottom there's an activity uh, before an exam. So it would cover a smaller part of the session. So I only had four categories, four amounts. and so. Uh, all of this can be changed as uh, per your preferences. And you can also, with a couch, you can also uh, make this available for the students they can practice at home. So I'm gonna stop the screen share here. What I wanted to show you, uh, um, something a bit more concrete, what it looks like when you put it together. So you should see the activity that I've, done for my class last semester, Quebec in Monde, world, uh, the Quebec uh, history, Quebec world history. And uh, so uh, the students can connect if you use the pay version, which is like $5 for a month. You can make it so that the cell phone of a person in the team uh, uh, is a buzzer. So that's great because it uh, adds a bit of competitiveness to the activity, a bit of excitement, but also allows the app tells me in what order they clicked. Uh, to answer. So there's five teams, there are five avatars here, there's only one, uh, because it's just to show you. So I'm showing you how I start the game. I was asked the first question, $100 in the first category, and then everybody has the right to answer. So uh, true or false, the, the Quebec 1774 had an objective to uh, gain the fidelity and loyalty of French Canadians. So $100 question, true or false. Uh, so the Quebec Act. So the person who lays their hand is the first uh, right answer. I uh, click on uh, the check mark and they get the $100. This is a $500 question now. Duplessis was uh, a fan of economic liberalism. Explain how that influenced his way of managing Quebec's economy. So once again, if there's the right answer, I click on the green check mark and 
it adds the amount of the answer appears on screen. One of the criticisms I have is that we're very limited in the number of characters. So uh, not ideal, but there are lots of advantages uh, that I see. Uh, one of the things that the students don't know is that when we uh, looked at, uh, when we answered all the categories at the end, there's a bonus question where the teams can uh, bet uh, some money. Uh, all of uh, their gains are part of it. If they have the right answer to the final question, it doubles their amount. And if uh, they have the wrong answer, they lose that uh, money. So when I talk about equality of chances, it happens often that a team that was really dominating the whole game bet all their money at the end and lost everything. And it's the other team that won. So uh, for uh, students, it's uh, a lot of fun. And there's also a flexibility of how you give the money. You could determine, for example, that a team is only a good part of the answer. So you can give part of the money, not the 500, for example, if they don't answer the question uh, fully. So that's what the plus and minus there. I also encourage the students in the same team to uh, collaborate, to uh, help each other uh, and consult with each other in this activity. So that's what I wanted to present. Um, I'm going to go back to the presentation. There you go. Uh, some suggestions and uh, comments that we see here. Um, you can have a look at them, Megali. We'll look at that. Uh, but yes, there are questions that have been asked uh, in uh, the Q and A. Perfect. I. Um, We'll keep some time. I'm almost uh, done. I wanted to show you as well. Um, one day I had done this activity and the Wi-Fi uh, had uh, stopped working. So this is how we uh, adapted. We did this on a chalkboard. It doesn't. You don't need any app. I copied uh, everything: the categories, the amount of money. The app generates uh, questions and answers automatically. But uh, you can just have questions and answers on a piece of paper. You can have them in front of you. And uh, we did it the same way. I started with the $100 question. And when the question was answered, I would take it off the board. And I asked a student to be uh, the point keeper, um, the judge. I didn't have to manage that. So uh, easy to adapt. It's the same principles, but with no technology. And uh, it uh, works just as well without the bells and whistles. And so uh, there's some music uh, in the game, but uh, you can adapt uh, uh, that to, to any content. This is history, but you can adapt it to uh, any uh, uh, other kind of subject or discipline. So this is a game that requires more time, um, 30 to 45 minutes, depending on the number of categories, uh, but you can really get into more complex questions here. So for the students, but also uh, in terms of digital skill, you don't need any for if you do it this way on the chalkboard. If you do it with an app, there's a bit of a learning curve. It's pretty simple, but you still have to know how to use it. You have to open an account, et cetera. Uh, the last activity I wanted to present is the uh, escape room. It's very simple, really. I didn't use any app. Uh, it's an envelope system, a paper, uh, piece of paper and envelope, but it could be done on Geniali. There's uh, genia.li that uh, allows you to do that, but this the red circle I was talking about at the beginning. It requires much more time to learn how to use it. So in my uh, escape room, escape game, the idea is to uh, get answers and uh, decipher the clues and depending on the, the different situations. So now I'm giving you uh, the situation I was using last uh, semester where we're going uh, uh, into prohibition and their friends are trying to get into a uh, uh, secret bar, a speakeasy. They have to give a secret code to get into the speakeasy. So uh, these are notions uh, that we had seen before and the students had uh, quite enjoyed studying prohibition and I thought that it would work very well with uh, an escape uh, room or an escape game. So they had five clues and each uh, clue is in a different envelope. So they have to find the first uh, uh, answer and uh, follow the clues. And uh, in each envelope, they have uh, uh, no instructions. They have uh, pieces of a puzzle, uh, a map, uh, some information, random words, and they have to use that and find uh, the answers uh, and follow the clues. So it can take uh, 
different forms. Sometimes it can be a sequence of numbers or words, and they have a pre-formatted uh, answer sheet, so they know what the answer looks like beforehand. And so I ask them to write the code on their uh, answer sheet and uh, uh, ask them to have it validated by a special agent, a secret agent, that would be me, and uh, to, uh, they can use their notes to uh, resolve the clues, and they can have uh, many uh, tries. Uh, uh, and they can try and fail many times and find the answer. Uh, there's no problem with that. So this is one of the envelopes they had. There's a, a bit more cards than this, but they uh, have visual cues. This is the con because this is the map of Quebec. They have to understand that these are maps that cover different times in history. So we can see here the, the uh, division between Quebec and Canada, or upper and lower Canada, unified Canada, and Quebec, Ontario. And they have to understand that they have to put them in the chronological order, for example. And uh, there's a number on each of the cards. So when they put them in order, they will have a combination of numbers, and that's the answer to the clue. But they still have to think. It seems pretty simple, but they have to think about the cause and effect. And um, so they have to think about the timeline and think uh, very deeply about what uh, map goes where and what the chronological order. So uh, this is the, I think the fifth envelope was a charade. So um, the first is Cinema of Invisible Idiot. My second is the... Uh, feminine uh, character that has wings and supernatural powers and imaginary uh, being. My third is, uh, can uh, be played, uh, and the, the uh, uh, third, uh, with showing through one is in an animal, third person, all the elements that you have to do for uh, an, an, uh, an animal for a day. And the answer was confederation. And uh, the four elements that you have to name to get your next envelope. So they have to give the four uh, founding, uh, provinces of confederation uh, and uh, there you go so um I use chat gpt i admit to formulate the historical charade so uh it was um, made it more e easier for me so an element that i want to say is that uh, this is the uh, escape uh, game uh, version but also uh, i want to introduce an individualized version the same elements more simplified maybe with more uh, Clues, but it could be uh, uh, form as, as the form of the exercise. They change stations every four minutes, so different stations. The same thing, the uh, same thing for the six that I presented. You can do it in a more traditional way, but it allows you really to um, create some engagement and some participation and uh, uh, some fun and into education. And it's pretty uh, simple to adapt. So now, if you use Jenny Ali, the red circle, and if not, it's very uh, simple. Just that you may have to think about. Uh, your charade so that they're interesting and throws a good uh, challenge. And uh, it could be 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how many envelopes you have, the complexity. In my case, it took about 20 minutes uh, for my students to complete the five envelopes. And uh, the five exercises covered a lot of elements uh, in my class. And we uh, are sometimes in more complex cognitive process. So these are the six uh, strategies, games that I want to present very briefly. Uh, talk about the perception of students. It'll take three minutes. Then we can take some questions. So I surveyed the students uh, in the fall 2021 on this aspect specifically uh, because I wanted feedback from my students every uh, um, every quarter, every trimester. I wanted to do a systematic revision of each class, and I wanted to get their perception from the students. So. They were about 25 people who answered uh, um, one group that semester. So in general, these activities of revision increased the modification and attention in class. So 73% uh, of uh, the answers were positive, 27% agree. So uh, nobody uh, more or less in agreement or in disagreement. And uh, also when I look back, uh, it uh, all made sense. And um, when... Uh, rev the, uh, revision activities were the efficient and revision the matter because of the uh, main ob objective. So I've asked them in the questionnaire uh, if the different activities, and uh, I asked them to say how they appreciated different activities, and the limit is uh, much uh, less important than the effic efficacy of the revision of the uh, material. So it was more positive. 82% said it was very efficient, 19% efficient, and uh, 19%. And uh, then I gave you some feedback that we would receive. The more um, main ones, and I didn't uh, correct any of the spelling mistakes, I'm sorry. I really liked the class and the activities were really useful to connect me with, my, with the, the, bring back uh, 
and revised knowledge. I love your creativity, your passion. The games were a lot of fun. You transmitted a lot of passion and fun during the uh, semester. And the last comment uh, really was nice to hear. I really liked that you took the time to connect to, with the material for other classes and it uh, motivates us before starting class on a Friday night. So thank you. Uh, so even if uh, it's uh, a bit biased, but uh, very positive comments. Uh, and I saw a good impact on the scores of my students. Uh, the glass average was better. People participated more, less abandonment rate, less uh, uh, people dropped the class and less absenteeism as well. So uh, more participation in class because they liked playing those games. So because it was a Friday night with this strategy, I didn't feel the impact of having the class on a Friday night. So now we are at the Q&A uh, session. Bravo, Megali, was very interesting. Uh, as usual, you're a very good conference speaker and uh, very inspiring as well. Many questions of four that come from Najwa. The first question is, are, is there research that shows that games favorize learning, particularly at university? And if yes, and what disciplines? And can you give us any references? As I said in the beginning, I am not an expert on uh, games and pedagogy. There's a lot of uh, literature that you can look at. I can maybe connect you with some resources to that end. But uh, there's lots of studies and literature. Uh, but uh, I included some in my presentation. And um, but uh, I may not be the best person to give you all these resources because it was more sharing my experience and practice rather than a more concrete research project. Another question from Najwa for students, what is the time to learn a new game? What is the average time to learn a new game for students? It must not be very long. It depends on the game, but the uh, crossword, puzzles, bingo, guess uh, who I am or guess what card I have on my forehead. It takes only a minute. Very simple. Most of the games I presented today don't necessarily need the students to learn uh, uh, the games really the most complex game is the timeline one where there are specific instructions but generally uh, uh, the instructions are very simple and for me that's very important i want the time uh, to uh, be spent on the game and the revision and not learning the game that's part of the conditions that i explained in the beginning that it would be something that should be easy to learn and not uh, too much complexity in learning the game so we can get right in to playing so uh, we need the students to understand everything right away Thank you. Uh, somebody is asking the question. It's Sarah. I don't know if it's a question related to your purpose, but you can use a you can use a buzzer on the cell phone and how? Yes, I imagine that it refers to Faxil. Yes, Faxil. Uh, well, in the pay version, as I said, it's about five dollars a month, and you can pay for a month only. And um, it, it, uh, do you need the pay version? Just to pay for the whole year, but it's not the case with Faxil. I buy it just before the activity. What it does is, um, like Couch, um, there's a code, and the student can connect to the game with his cell phone. And so there's one in the team that has the buzzer, but in the free version, we don't have access to this buzzer. And when we get into Faxil, they're asking the question, do you want to be in buzzer mode or not? And it's uh, Pretty simple, and so that's uh, the answer I can give. Well, there are questions also in the Q and A. Um, can we learn with these games at all ages? Are some games appropriate to certain ages and not others? And uh, what age group students uh, do you have for your games? Uh, very varied because I do. Uh, continue education. Some people are older than me. Some people are younger than me in my class. Some people are, are going getting back to school. They uh, like uh, the games, young as well as old. Of course, it's important to uh, um, have a bit of complexity, but not too much. And so it's adapted uh, for all age groups uh, and adaptable rather. And it depends on the variety of strategies that you use. You don't have to do like I do 
and do it uh, every uh, class at the beginning of class time. I didn't always do that. So um, the idea is just to vary the different types of strategies we use. And also that's why it won't work if you always do the same game uh, every class. So it's more about varying the kinds of games. I have 40 year old students, 50 year old students sometimes, and they are just as interested in playing as the younger ones. And I can have 17 year old students sometimes as well. It's very much a wide age range and it works for them. Thank you. Uh, Simon Masikot uh, is asking uh, the negative uh, impacts of uh, competition and it reminds me of Alfie Cohn's work, uh, the case against competition. Published punish my rewards. Uh, Simon is asking if you read this article and if you have any suggestions. Collaborative games, uh, the pluses and minuses of competition versus collaboration and in games. So I haven't saw that. I haven't seen that, but I took note of it. Uh, of it and I uh, uh, cited a lot of interesting sources and studies. Uh, so if you have the QR code and you can go see uh, the title is Esque de Gagne is the best person always winning. It's a literature review that I did on different elements and it's uh, from this literature review that I arrived with uh, conditions and strategies for competition and collaboration in, my game, in the games that I use that I really uh, uh, I take note of the uh, study site and the resource. I'm going to go see a very interesting. Somebody is asking, I don't know if you can answer the question, but I think um, what technical question? What can you use for generally to allow you to publish uh, the points to get points? Well, it, uh, notably, because I haven't used it uh, in that way yet on Genially. I used it in other games, but I haven't used it uh, for a game in Genially. I don't know if somebody in the chat uh, can help answer that question. Well, there are people who are answering the question, and I, I know the Genially. I it's integrated puzzles that people can complete online and all kinds of those are lots of games in generally already that are uh, set up. I saw that it's kind of like a monopoly game. There's all kinds of uh, different kinds of games that are already there. Yes, what last question, Najwa, for the efficacy of a game? Are there parameters depending on the number of students or the, uh, the time you want to use? It depends on the nature of the game. As I was saying, um, uh, can only answer for myself with my experience, but I encourage uh, teams to favorize collaboration. So that's my way of uh, reducing the competitive aspect, the fact that we encourage uh, collaboration, but also it allows them to uh, learn uh, together as peers. And so I uh, make teams of at least three players and uh, beyond five players, I think there are risks that the students uh, who maybe are not as engaged, don't participate as much. So you need a small group size, small team size so that everybody can participate. Between three and five uh, is the ideal size of teams uh, for games. There are other games that I haven't presented that may uh, be working with larger teams, but it depends. For the length, that really depends on the type of game uh, you use. The idea is to not take 45 minutes to do uh, Revision. The idea is to have a quick activity in the beginning of class. Thank you, Magali. Once again, it was very interesting. People have really liked it. And I ask people to fill out the uh, evaluation survey. It takes a few seconds, a few minutes. Uh, thank you, Magali, and hope to see you again in another webinar. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you, everybody, for having been with us.